Hello everybody and welcome to uh, our online lectures that you'll be listening to in my absence. Um, we'll have a couple lectures on Gestalt psychology as we uh, march our way through the history of psychology. And in many ways we are kind of still in the same, oh, I don't know what you want to call it, the same kind of historical period, the same atmosphere as we were for when we talked about psychoanalysis and even really the beginning of scientific psychology with Wilhelm Wundt. Um, Gestalt psychology uh, begins around the turn of the last century, just like all those things I just mentioned, in basically the same place, uh, in Germany. Um, you know, Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire are really you know, kind of the, the two areas that are giving birth to uh, much of modern psychology. Um, Gestalt itself is a German word for shape or form. Um, that being said, as we go through Gestalt psychology, sometimes it's easier to think of this uh, with the adjective whole, like W-H-O-L-E, <laughs> whole in front of it, like the whole shape or the whole form, getting the overall pattern of something. Uh, Max Wertheimer was really the first to get this approach started. Um, in the early 1800s, he, based on his experience in, in riding a train and realizing, noticing, as you probably have, if you've ridden in cars or what have you, that uh, you know certain aspects of the environment seem to pass by at different rates of time, some things you know speeding by very fast, other things off in the distance moving more slowly. Uh, he, he began to study perception of, of movement. And as he did so, he got uh, interested in and explored this idea of the phi phenomenon. Um, the phi phenomenon, very simply, is when we perceive movement because a stationary stimulus is like blinking off and on. Okay, in other words, there's a stationary stimulus, it's got like a, a presence and then an absence. Okay, kind of blinking off and on. Uh, and because of that, we perceive movement. Now that may sound a little bit strange. Uh, what is that all about? Um, actually, you are very familiar with this if you watch movies or videos or anything like that because movies and videos rely on the Phi phenomenon. Uh, as you probably know, um, a video or a movie is basically made up of lots of still pictures, right? And those still pictures are basically turned off and on really quickly uh, in sequence, and there's such slight differences between them that you perceive it to be one instant movement. All right, so I would encourage you to um, take a look at these links, and you'll see some more simpler examples of the five phenomenon. And just notice that, like, if you go to the first link, you'll see, uh, you know, a series of dots, and you'll see that one or more dot uh, turns off and on quickly in a certain pattern and it gives the illusion uh, of movement. And, and the Phi phenomenon basically is an optical illusion. Um, so I would encourage you to visit these links. Uh, the first one will take you right to some examples of the Phi phenomenon. The second one, uh, you'll see there's different sections on the website, and I think you have to go to the, the second one, if I'm not mistaken, to see some examples. Uh, but it's clear once you get there um, where you need to go. Uh, so Wertheimer, um, began this, this area of psychology, this, this approach to things uh, that became to be known as Gestalt psychology. Uh, Wertheimer, like so many people uh, in the um, early to mid-1900s, actually left Germany. Uh, Wertheimer himself came to the United States, as did many of the Gestalt psychologists, as we'll talk about next time. Uh, Wertheimer himself landed uh, in New York, and in particular in the New School for Social Research which had as one of its goals at that point in time to welcome all these scholars from Central Europe who were fleeing the Nazi threat. Uh, and you will encounter a little bit about that in, in your reading as well. So what is the basic idea behind Gestalt psychology? One of the main concepts is that our perception is holistic. And that's holistic with a W, W-H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, right? Holistic. Uh, in other words, we perceive stimuli not in, as isolated items, but in connection with one another and in reference to their context. So, for example, um, 
when you're looking, you know, for example, at one of those series of dots in the first link, uh, the whole, the meaning of the whole pattern is not held just in one dot. As you see a dot turn off and on, you interpret that in the context of what's happening with the dots close to it, um, and also in connection with the entire context. And Gestalt psychologists, although they're most famous for studying, studying perception, they studied many other things as well, uh, including child development, and they would say kind of the same thing about like a child. Like you can't understand a single child in isolation. You have to understand um, you know, how the different parts of the child fit together, how their thinking and their emotions are connected, and you also have to understand that child uh, in his or her context. And, and we'll see this time that ultimately this leads to kind of some major shifts in the way we view kids. Um, so from this study of perception and this basic idea that a particular stimulus is always interpreted, you know, kind of in its context, uh, this basic Gestalt principle was developed, which, as far as I understand, translates best as the whole is not the same of the sum of its parts. You may have heard the whole is different than the sum of its parts, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, I don't speak German, but some of the sources I've consulted said that this is the, the best definition. Uh, you know, it's not that the individual parts are wrong or irrelevant, uh, but when you put um, you know, a, a heart uh, together with lungs, together with a liver, together with a stomach, uh, and so on, um, you don't just end up with a whole mess of organs if they're structured right, and in a particular context you end up with a person. And that is not the same as simply a pile of organs. Okay, so the idea here is that um, the, the entire pattern of objects is something different than simply all of those objects tossed together. In many ways, this at first is a reaction against structuralism in Europe, and then once Gestalt psychology settles in the United States, a reaction against behaviorism. Hopefully you can see why this is a reaction against structuralism, right? I mean, the main idea of structuralism is to break something down into its very specific parts, you know, and kind of analyze those parts independently, whereas Gestalt psychology is saying you can't do that. That's not how we as people operate. Um, and as we'll see in our next slide, it's actually not how the world operates. Uh, you know, so you, you've got to look at the, the entire organism or the entire experience uh, that is composed of many different parts to understand any phenomenon. Um, and then ultimately Gestalt psychology reacts against behaviorism as well. Uh, because Gestalt psychology gives credence to perception and uh, to the way individuals interpret their life experiences and, and life events and basic stimuli in the environment. Uh, it is obviously going well beyond behavior. Um, you know, we remember that people like Watson and, and Skinner, it's not that they completely denied anything was happening inside, but they they simply didn't even touch it. I mean, it was not worth their time because they didn't feel they could measure it. And so Gestalt psychology is reacting against that or, or providing a counter voice by saying, no, um, actually you have to look at things, processes, internal processes like perception, um, because they are approaching the world differently, uh, you know, than, um, than what the world seems to be, if that makes sense. I mean, as we perceive, we, we, we do things in our head, <laughs> inside of ourselves, to interpret information, uh, and it's not just about, you know, our behavior, uh, how, we're, how we're acting. Let's move on and talk about some of the roots of this Gestalt approach. On this slide, we're going to take a look at three of the intellectual roots of the Gestalt approach. And then in our next um, file, the next PowerPoint presentation, we'll take a look at several uh, key Gestalt thinkers and what their contributions were. Um, so in terms of the intellectual roots, we're looking at things either before or outside of Gestalt psychology that influenced it. Uh, if we go back to kind of its philosophical roots, we run up against Immanuel Kant, 
who is somebody you've encountered in your reading, uh, and I may have mentioned him briefly in class, but we didn't spend much time on him. Uh, Kant is, gosh, perhaps the most influential uh, enlightenment thinker um, in Europe. You know, certainly there are others who are very, very important too, but uh, Kant just, you know, is kind of a, uh, a foundational philosopher in modern Western culture. You see his dates there. You see uh, he is German, and that's really kind of theme going on here, right? I mean, in terms of, of the Gestalt approach, lots of German stuff popping up, and it's going to continue to pop up. Um, Kant was, was very influenced by David Hume. Remember we talked about him? He's one of the Scottish philosophers. Uh, but Kant was not an associationist. Remember, most of the people who advocated associationism were from England. Uh, and, and Kant, although he really respected Hume a lot, uh, did not believe in associationism. Um, he thought that there were types of thinking that were too complex to be simply explained by connecting one stimulus to another, one perception to another. Uh, and he also believed in what is basically innate ideas. Remember, associationists uh, basically believe in tabula rasa. Although we don't call John Locke an associationist, he predated the associationists. His idea of tabula rasa uh, fits very well with associationism, and, and Kant does not believe in tabula rasa. He believes that we come into the world with some a priori ideas. Uh, a priori meaning prior or in advance, right? And one of the things he thought we brought into the world are certain organized patterns of perception, um, which is what the Gestalt psychologists are going to come to talk about. Uh, and I gotta say, as a uh, developmental psychologist who's very interested in, in young children in particular, I think there's actually some evidence that Kant was right on this. Uh, for example, one organized perceptual pattern he thought we basically were born with was the idea of causality. Uh, you know, to attribute causality to, uh, you know, stimuli that we see in the environment that are connected somehow. Uh, and there is some evidence that very young babies um, have that idea of causality. And uh, for those of you who have had child development, maybe you can even remember some of that. So anyway, that aside, um, <laughs> Kant in many ways lays the foundation for uh, the Gestalt approach. And he's also going to lay the foundation, by the way, for phenomenology, which is going to be the third point we talk about today. Um, but before we get to phenomenology, I want to talk about quantum physics, which uh, may sound a little bit strange. How, how would physics uh, you know, influence psychology? But actually, we've already seen this to some extent, right? When we talked about Isaac Newton and uh, his mechanical view of the world, right? Gravity and so forth, uh, and how that transferred ultimately to kind of a mechanical view of, of the human. Well, as you may know, uh, around the turn of the last century, um, physicists started, uh, well, I guess kind of being blown away is maybe the best way to buy some patterns they were seeing in nature that, that violated Isaac Newton's uh, ideas about regular kind of mechanics, if you will. Um, and in particular, they were finding these patterns, or lack thereof, uh, at really the, the, the micro, micro, microscopic level. Um, in other words, like when you break down atoms, of course, there's still particles in there, and they were finding that these particles, these subatomic particles, uh, behaved in very strange ways. And this is not a class in quantum physics. I am not even qualified to think about teaching that, but um, I do want you to know just a little bit uh, about this um, the school of thought that has a lot of evidence behind it, uh, because it does, number one, it does start to get us thinking in a slightly different way, I think, about people, and number two, as they've brought quantum physics into uh, the realm of biology, which they are starting to do, that it may well change the way we understand people. Um, so there are a variety of findings within quantum physics. Uh, I just have a, a link to a very short clip about quantum entanglement, which I'd encourage you to look at. The idea of quantum entanglement is that uh, in some cases, maybe in many cases, 
who knows, maybe in all cases, um, particles from atoms become entangled. In other words, it's kind of like they, they get attached to each other. And what's really bizarre is that attachment seems to be maintained even if you separate the particles uh, so that great distances separate them. And how we know there's still this attachment or entanglement, as they call it, is that if you make a change in one of those particles, instantaneously the other particle makes a change as well. That second particle changes in the opposite direction. So if you, uh, this, I don't think they actually do this, but just for as an example, if you were to change one particle white, the other particle would immediately change black to, to the color black. Okay, uh, and, and what this does is it shows us that um, even on the very, very basic level of the structure of, of the universe, things are connected. Okay, you know, certainly we've known that about like, you know, biological systems for a long time, but even, uh, you know, with just like electrons and, and things like that, uh, stuff is connected and it forms a system. Okay, um, and then that system, as all the different parts interact, produces a whole. Okay, which is basically what Gestalt psychology is saying uh, about the human being and perceptual processes. Um, and it's not for that there's a parallel here. Wertheimer, uh, the founder of Gestalt psychology, was actually working at an institute in Germany where you know, basically quantum physics was, was getting started. In fact, I think Einstein worked there at the same time, although Einstein, although I think he dabbled in quantum physics at the beginning, um, did not end up pursuing it. So in any case, I, I would like you to just take a look at that, that link, and uh, I would encourage you, you know, when you have time, ha-ha, right, <laughs> Christmas break, uh, to check out some of the um, documentaries on YouTube about quantum physics. If you just type in, like, Quantum physics, uh, Brian Green, whose last name is spelled G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E. uh, he's got a lot of very accessible, very understandable uh, documentaries, entertaining documentaries on quantum physics. He's a physicist at, I think, Columbia University. Um, and you, your mind will pretty much be blown, I think. Anyway, <laughs> um, so here again, just like we saw with Newton back during the scientific revolution, we do have this kind of connection between where physics is going and where psychology is going. Um, and then finally, the, the last intellectual route we're going to talk about at least is phenomenology, which is a, a school of philosophy, but there's it's really kind of boiled over into psychology as well. You can find, uh, you know, at gr the graduate level schools on phenomena or classes on phenomenological psychology and so forth. But it started out as a philosophy, uh, begun by, yet again, uh, another, uh, well, Husserl, actually, I think Husserl might have been Czech, but he was of a German background and, uh, and studied in Germany. Um, so again, we're, we're back in Germany. Uh, and basically, the idea behind phenomenology was uh, to study phenomena, in other words, various things or events, uh, from the experiential perspective of people. So if you want to know what going to a university class is like, it's not that you'd sit there and, you know, chart behavior and, and what have you, but you do interviews, in-depth interviews of people. Uh, you know, what is your experience like as you go to class and so forth? And, and from that, you get this kind of holistic picture that tells you how the different aspects of the experience of the event fit there. Okay. Um, from individual perceptions or individual perspectives. Uh, so in a philosophical way, this kind of does what Wertheimer was doing with uh, the five phenomenon. Okay, so we see uh, a variety of roots here from the, um, you know, enlightenment philosophical approach of Kant through some of the contemporary movements. And by contemporary, I mean happening at the same time as Gestalt psychology, contemporary movements of quantum physics and phenomenology. In our next series of slides, we'll talk a little bit about the major players in Gestalt psychology.